Good morning, Ma. It's my pleasure meeting and speaking with you today. Um, this interview is part of the Global Feminism Project, a multi-site uh, international project sponsored by the University of Michigan. Um, our goal is in undertaking this oral history uh, is to create and preserve conversations with women whose scholarship and or activism has contributed to the advancement of women and uh, a lot of focus on the issues that affect women and feminists, you know, globally. And we would like to start out by asking uh, you to introduce yourself. Please tell me your full names and how you would like to be addressed. In telling me your full names, I would also ha like to have the spelling on okay. record so that I don't misrepresent <laughs> you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Uh, my name is Josephine Efa Chukuma. Josephine, J-O-S-E-P-H-I-N-E. -E. Efa Chukuma is a compound name. E-F-F-A-H hyphen C-H-U-K-W-U-M-A. So that's Josephine Efa Chukuma. And I'm the um, founder, executive director of Project Alert on Violence Against Women an organization set up in January 1999 to promote and protect the rights of women and young girls in Nigeria, especially the rights of women and girls to live a life free of violence. So in a nutshell, that's just been a fact. That's, that's, that's who I am. Um, I'd like to be addressed as Josephine. Okay. All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank so you. Uh, let's just get started. So uh, what really, in your background, drove you to this work? How did you start? I'm a Nigerian. I was born in Nigeria in the 60s, mid 60s. I grew up in Nigeria. I grew up in Lagos specifically. I came from a very close-knit family. My family from Cross River State, um, Calabar. But my parents mar got married and had us all in Lagos. And like I said, a very close-knit family of six girls. And I, I never, I wasn't conscious of the difference between the genders, girl and boy in our home, because it was never an issue. You know, I had cousins coming to live, we played around, you know. But by the time I was getting to 13, 14, 15 years of age, a lot of things started hitting me. You know, I mean, you're in school, you're socializing with people, you have neighbors around you. And the first thing that hit me as a 13-year-old was an auntie of mine whom my dad was so fond of. And actually, she got married from her compound. I mean, my, my, my dad used to call her mommy because according to him, she was one sister of ease that looked so much like their mom. So he calls her mommy. And he was so fond of her. And then she got married and um, got married to a very abusive man. And I remember, you know, almost every time, I can't count how many times, she would come running to the house with torn blouses and, you know, and I'm like, and my dad would be so hungry, my mom would be upset and everything. And I'm like, ah, what's going on here? That was one. Then I had a neighbor who died, a couple, an Igbo man, you know, but I think his mom was Yoruba because his, he gives some of his children Yoruba names. You know, when people have mixed marriages like that, you see them oftentimes trying to reflect the ethnicity of both people, you know, Efik and Ibo or Yoruba and Hausa. You want the Hausa parents will give a Hausa name, the Ibo parents will give, you know, that kind of a thing. So he was called Baba Dele because they had a son called Dele, you know, and they had four girls and a boy, and Dele was the last. And then this man had an accident, was in hospital for a while, and then he died. And then I saw the way his family swooped in like vampires and whatever, and the way the, there was a lot of drama, you know, in relation to the wife and, and you know, children and property and a lot of things. And then, of course, I went to university a lot. Of, so growing up as a young teenager up to young adulthood, I was becoming angry about a lot of things. I had a lot of questions you know, about the way and manner women and girls were being treated, you know. Saw some of my friends in university having boyfriends who beat them, you know. So this was, unconsciously, that was how it started. As a young girl, wondering, questioning a lot of uh, things about the treatment of women and girls. 
you know. So that was how it all started for me. And um, somehow, by the time I was leaving university, there's some key decisions I'd made to myself. I was like, Josephine, you're going to draw boundaries in relationship. Josephine, you're not going to be treated like shit. Josephine, you're going to buy your first car by yourself. No one is going to buy it for you because I happen to have a friend doing you service. The man bought her a car, and because they had a problem, the man said, drop that skis there. And I'm like, you know, someone is playing God with you, yeah. You know, so all those things together. And then by the time I finished, um, my, I mean, graduated from university, and I did my youth service, the compulsory one year youth service, and um, I was working up north in Kaduna, you know, as a journalist. It was then I started, you know, I have always loved reading and writing. I love writing, I love reading a lot. So while I was a, a proofreader, I was engaged in the newspaper as a proofreader for a while, you know, I would always write. And I wasn't trying, you know, always writing about serious stuff, you know, things affecting women and all of that. I, I can remember some of my fellow coppers, they said, Justin, you're too serious. You take life too seriously. I enjoy youth service. Youth service is funny time. It's one year of fun. You want to win the Copper of the Year award, you know, and all of those things. You know, but I had fun. But I always had this in mind that being a girl, being a woman, I shouldn't be judged by my looks or the lipstick I have on or the clothes I have on. I should be judged by my brains. I've got brains. You know, there are a lot of much more serious stuff affecting women other than gume, fashion, you know, lipstick, and you know. So. Typically, newspapers those days, they believe that if you're a woman writing, you should be writing about food, you're writing about fashion, and they never saw any of that with me. It was like, you this young girl, what's, what's it? Life is not so serious. Come on. Be your age, 21, 22, and, you know, and all of that. So, yeah, so that was it. And then um, that was where I cut my tooth. And then from there, I got admission to the Netherlands to study at the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague. And guess what the course was? Um, development studies, specializing in women and development, now called gender studies. And that was where I caught my tooth, and that was where I got grounded in feminism okay. and feminist theories. Mm -hmm. And that was when I said to me, okay, now I understand a lot of the hunger. I now understand a lot of the questioning, you know, I had as a young girl. The issue of socialization, the issue of gender discrimination, gender stereotyping, you know, and all of that. Feminism, okay. patriarchy, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, then, so what does your career look like right now? I'm at the peak of it, of my career. I mean, I've, I've this is 25 years of being an activist okay. and 20 years of founding and running projects a lot on violence against women. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I would say, Without knowing it, I've been a feminist all my life. But I didn't know it, of course, in my teenage years. But I was questioning things. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, is feminism. Mm -hmm. When you're seeing injustices perpetrated against women and girls, and you're asking, why, why, why? You know, you don't just take it for granted or take it as given that. It's OK. That's the way women should be treated. You know, and I'm like, why? But the boy is not being treated this way. Why is the girl being treated this way? The man is not being treated this way. Why is the woman being treated this way? And all of that. So. At the point I'm in now is a point where, um, sitting back and looking back, one has come a long way and one is asking, what next? And then for the younger ones, it's getting the younger ones also to be active. You know, the whole issue of intergenerational dialogues, intergenerational uh, 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 feminists across generations talking and all of that. So, yes, I mean, I've, I've spent 25, going to 26 years. And uh, in all of these years, what would you say are some of your most significant lifetime achievements? For me, the, the most significant lifetime achievement for me has been founding Project Alert on Violence Against Women mm -hmm. and bringing it, building it up to the position it is in now. Because Project Alert on Violence Against Women is actually the first women's rights organization run from a feminist perspective using feminist advocacy strategy, which is all about not seeing issues of violence against women as an isolated 
case of one crazy man against a woman, but more at structures and institutions. You know, there are systems that allow, that tolerate, that, you know, justifies the treatment of women. You know, you talk of patriarchy, you talk of, you know, the family as an institution and all of that. So for me, founding, breaking the silence, Project Alert was the first women's rights organization to deliberately and specifically focus on violence against women. Before then, you had some broad human rights organization like constitutional rights projects, like civil liberties organization. You had um, community health, um, um, uh, Ngozi um, Awareness Group, you know. But they were working on broad human rights issues. Um, community health was, um, uh, rights, um, Ngozi Awareness Group was focusing on community, uh, grassroots community advocacy and all of that. So Project Alert came in at that time to, to, to occupy a, a, a glaring, I mean, a space that was so, there was, there, there, was, there, was, there was a vacancy, clearly. And that was just after the Fourth, fourth, World, uh, fourth World Conference on Women, Beijing, 1995. During that conference, the outcome of that conference was 12 critical areas of concern, known as the Beijing Platform for Action. It identified 12 critical areas of concern as areas that governments the world over should look at. And one of such areas, one of the areas was violence against women. I was a young 28-year-old at that time when I attended that conference. And my takeaway from there, coming back, was that I need to start some things on violence against women. I need to deliberately, we need a group that would deliberately focus on abuse of women. We need a group that will set up a shelter for abused women and protect her. We need a group that will consciously carry out research and documentation. Because I studied development studies focusing on women and development. And I remember when I was writing my thesis in the Netherlands then, 93, 94. I basically ran into a dead end. I remember sitting there in the Netherlands sending you know, messages back home to friends, family members. Please, I need information, I need statistics on domestic violence, occurrence rate, prevalence rate, you know, impact, all of that. Nothing, there was nothing. I almost threw up my hands and I almost gave up on that thing because this was a primary research. This was supposed to be a primary research, of course, with some secondary research. What has been written, review of relevant literature. The little I saw was from Women in Nigeria, WIN, which happens to be the first consciously developed feminist group in Nigeria. WIN, Women in Nigeria. Uh, and my supervisor then in the Netherlands happens to be an American who was based in Nigeria that, before then and was one of the three, four women who started women in Nigeria. Her name was Reni Peeton. Reni Peeton, Professor Benny Madunagu, Aisha Imam, and there was one other lady, I can't remember her name. Those were the ladies that started women in Nigeria, starting from Amadu Bello University in Zaria. So some of the conferences and papers presented at workshops were the things I basically fell back on to a very large extent. So. When I decided to start Project Alert, I said to myself, the first program and the program that will be dearest to my heart will be research and documentation. In order to be part of the solution and not part of the problem, we need to generate information, generate data to help academics, to help activists, anyone and everyone interested in this, contribute to knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. for me, that's what I'll pride myself that I've done using Project Alert. Okay. So in the course of all of this work, what kind of issues do you see that really curse, abuse, assault of women? And then I know that uh, you have that shelter and I imagine that you've been having like cases even from the outset. How prevalent and what kind of things result into uh, gender, uh, women and gender violence? 
the, in Nigeria. What I always tell people that if I'm to answer that question honestly, mm -hmm. really, there's no reason for abuse of women and girls, mm -hmm. for gender-based violence. Yeah. There's absolutely no reason. What people prefer as reasons are often justifications, basically people trying to justify their actions. But like I said earlier, when you look at the issue of gender-based violence, for you to get a proper understanding of it, then you need to look at systems and structures in place. And at the, at the foundation of this is patriarchy, the rule of men. Nigeria is a patriarchal society, just like many other African societies and even countries in Europe and America. They are not totally exempt from patriarchy, but the level, the occurrence rate, and the prevalence rate, and the entrenchment rate could be different, relatively different, but patriarchy is a global issue. So if you look at patriarchy, a system that favors men, a system that makes men feel entitled, actually gives them an edge over women, you'll understand why gender-based violence is going on. Because patriarchy says men are superior and above to women. A, male ch a woman, when she gives birth to three female children, two even, and the third one is a female again, guess what? She starts crying for herself. She starts feeling sorry for herself. Why? Because the number of children don't start, they don't start, they don't start counting them until the first boy comes. The other ones, the other three, four, five, they are not human, they are girls. You know, that's it, that's patriarchy, that's culture. Because patriarchy is now taken into culture, it's taken into religion, it's taken into even laws where you see discriminatory laws for similar offenses. I can give an example of that. In the criminal code in Nigeria, for example, rightly, in law, similar offenses should carry similar punishment. But in our criminal code, you will see indecent assault hmm, of, a woman, of a girl is considered to be a misdemeanor, meaning a lesser offense. Indecent assault of a boy is considered to be a felony, a higher offense. And the first question is, what do you define, what do you, how do you define indecent assault? One. Two, between a male and a female, who is most likely to be indecently assaulted? between a male and a female. Indecent is what it is, indecent. Hmm? Who gets more assaulted? Most likely the female, more of the female. And so it tells you that the girl is a lesser, it's more severe for you to ass indecently assault a boy or a male. If it's a girl, it's a woman, you know, it's okay to some extent. So you see a lot of a huge tolerance level mm. for abuse of women and young girls. A little girl is raped and you're trying to seek justice for her and someone tells you, come on, it's just sex. She's going to forget it. She's a child. She can't, you know, she won't remember. It's just sex. She wasn't killed. She wasn't butchered. Her legs were not, were not cut. You know, so it's just sex. And I'm like, rape is not sex. Rape is abusive sex. Sex is what, ordinary sex, I put it in quotes, is one I consent to and I, I enjoy it with you. But rape is not consensual sex. It's abusive sex. It's violent sex. So you can't just call rape sex. You know, and all of that. So, these are some of the issues, you know, that, you know, you know like people say, so, there are a lot of so culture, tradition, the religion, the manipulation and misinterpretation of religious books. You know, when people say it's when a woman is not, you know, the Bible says a woman should be subservient, should be submissive to the husband. Bam. It's true. 
But what does the same Bible say about the man? Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave up his life for it, for, for the church. You know? Where does submissiveness stop? So they use submissiveness, they manipulate and misinterpret that to mean, you know, a woman must be an idiot. So even when your husband tells you, go kill somebody or go rob a bank, because you have to be submissive, you've got to go do it. So if you don't do that, then you get punished for that by way of beating. Yeah? So it's okay. You know? So what people call causes, like I said, reasons, I said, like I said, there are no reasons. There are mere justification because really there are, there's no reason for uh, gender-based violence. Every human being, man, woman, and child, has the right to life, to dignity of the human person, to freedom from torture. And what, if you look at every form of gender-based violence, if you look at the entire gamut of gender-based violence, be it domestic, be it non-domestic, physical, be it sexual, be it harmful traditional practices, sexual harassment, rape, in every act of gender-based violence, several human rights abuses have taken place. Threats to life. Women die as a result of domestic violence and sexual abuse. Their lives get threatened. Dignity of the human person gets taken away. You get raped. You get gang raped. Is that dignifying? Torture. What is rape if it is not torture? What is domestic violence if it is not torture? Physical and psychological. So, every, in every act of gender-based violence that occurs, one or more, in fact, several acts Several human rights abuses have taken place. That's what happens when we talk of gender-based violence. So I imagine that in the course of this work, there have been a lot of things, you know, including litigation oh, yeah. and all of that. Yeah. And uh, are there some of the some ways that your experience is doing this work uh, have resulted to some kind of even changes in your in the way that you engage with the feminism and um, activism. Yeah. Project Alert has come a long way. Like I said, we're 20 years this year. And like I said, right from the beginning, at the birth of Project Alert, I am the founder, but I founded Project Alert along with five other women. And we're all, we are all women in our 40s and 50s now. We're all women that we are born in Nigeria. Because one thing with Nigerians, when we want to shy away from something, the first thing we'll say, oh, it's a foreign concept. It's a foreign, you know, you come with, because you, you were born in the US, in the UK, you come in with all this. No, we we're all born in Nigeria. I was born in Lagos. I grew up in Suleri. You know, I saw a lot of things happening as a child, as a young adult. So all of us, so right from the beginning, we were very clear that, and we all coincidentally, are feminist in the sense that we interrogate we question you know people shy away from that word feminist and I tell people it's okay if you don't want to okay I'm a gender activist I'm a, I said okay it's okay but let me tell you just one thing for as long as you are questioning the treatment of women for as long as you are seen and fighting for social injustices against women and girls. For as long as you are saying it's not okay for a girl to be raped, a woman to be raped. For as long as you're saying that your daughter should be safe in any environment, you're a feminist. Because it's all about social, you're fighting social injustices. Mm -hmm. So, we were, we were very clear that Project Alert was being set up to respond, to deal with the issues of violence against women using feminist advocacy strategies. And like I said earlier, what do I mean by feminist advocacy strategies? Feminist advocacy strategies involves engaging systems. 
engaging systems, moving beyond. You know, the feminist struggle has come a long way. When it started, it was all about, oh, you know, especially when you're talking about, uh, uh, I mean, it's, the women's suffrage started with, you know, the whole issue of um, voting rights, you know, being able to vote as women, you know, and all of that, equal pay for equal work and all of that, you know. And then the issue of domestic violence, initially it was seen as, it's a crazy man, that man must be a crazy man, you know. A sane man will not do this. But feminist advocacy strategy is saying, no, it's not just that crazy man. It is the system that is allowing him to do that. A dysfunctional system, a patriarchal system, you know, which informs the criminal justice system. Because who, who creates all this? Who makes laws? Human beings. Mm -hmm. hmm? Who are in the courts? Who are the judges and the policemen? Human beings. And they are men and women. You know, with the men already being at an advantage because of patriarchy. You know? So right from the beginning, we knew we were challenging patriarchy. Right from the beginning, we said we were employing feminist advocacy strategies, which included carrying out research and documentation. You know? And that is why, for us in Project Alert, every intervention, every single intervention um, that has been carried out in the 20 years of this organization starts with a research. Our very first research was the very first nationwide documentation of the prevalence, the forms, and the impact of violence against women in Nigeria. The, the, the title of that came out in a book report we titled Beyond Boundaries. And what is the meaning of beyond boundaries? We're saying Violence against women was beyond boundaries. It's not, I mean, it cuts across ethnicity. It, I mean, it's not about how educated or how beautiful you are. It wasn't only affecting Muslims or Christians. It wasn't only affecting Northerners as against Southerners. Hmm? Or the poor against the rich. The key thing is you are a woman. And just that fact that you are a woman or a girl exposes you to the risk very high risk of being abused, you know? So every single intervention. So that document, that, that research threw up to us the need for a shelter, which is the reason why two years after 2001, we opened the very first shelter for abused women in Nigeria. Imagine as recent as 2001. Meanwhile, shelters came out from the feminist movement in the 70s in the 70s, 70s, 80s. But in Nigeria, the very first shelter for abused women in Nigeria was set up by Project Alert, and it's called Sophia's Place. Actually, that is the building right there. That's the, that's, no, that picture, that's it. Oh, okay. That's the building. Mm -hmm. So it's the first shelter for abused women known as Sophia's Place. And why Sophia? Sophia is a Greek name, uh, and a Catholic name, and it's, Sophia means wisdom. And basically what Project Alert is saying is that women Please be wise. You don't need to die. Marriage is not a death sentence. You don't need to be silent. Project Alert came into existence at a time when there was a lot of silence. Silence was a weapon, a severe weapon used against women because women did not talk. They were scared. They were frightened. They were ashamed. They were, they were, they were, they were, they were ridiculed. And so we came in to break the silence. You know, so every, be it the shelter, be it our legal aid, that is yet another feminist advocacy strategy. We give, as part of our practical support services, the shelter is there, legal aid, we have lawyers, we take up cases for women in court, you know, and then we engage the system. In the 20 years of the existence of Project Alert, we have worked with other, um, I mean, since during this period, other organizations have come up. There have been this, I mean, we, there has been legal reforms. There have been legal reforms. There are laws now. When Project Alert came into existence in 1999, there was no state that had a domestic violence law. The Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act of today, which sort of redefines and broadens the definition of rape, was not in existence. Female genital mutilation laws were not in existence. 
widowhood practice laws were not in existence, but now we have all of that. So this is what feminist advocacy strategies does. You know, you engage the system. You, 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 you engage in legal reforms. You engage in policy advocacy, social advocacy, media, engaging the media. This is what we have done over the years. Okay, great, wonderful. And uh, I'm just wondering, I know you began to talk, uh, uh, touch on some of these issues yeah. already. Yeah. For you, what, what do you perceive to be the relationship between scholarship and activism? I mean, I mean uh, feminist scholarship and uh, activism. What is the relationship? The relationship, ideally, should be a symbiotic one, a marriage. Okay. Because both activism fits into academics. Academics fits into advocacy. I will use the example of Project Alert. At the point Project Alert started in 1999, there was little or nothing being done in terms of academics, feminist academics. I mean, like I said, it started with the, 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 the the first organized feminist movement in Nigeria was women in Nigeria. And the women in, in, involved in this were women, academic, women in the academics. Mm -hmm. Rennie Pittin was a, a lecturer in Amadebelo University, okay. Zaria. Professor Benny Madunagu was a lecturer in University of Calabar. Aisha Imam was also an academic. So they, so they saw a lot of this thing, so it started off. And they started engaging, and they sort of got, you know, got other people involved in it. But beyond that, as it went on, it moved more into activism. It was more, we, you know, the next generation after that, it was more of activism. With little or nothing being done academically, in terms of theories, you know, localizing and all of that, you know. So that, when Project Alert started, that was why we had to, our starting point was research and documentation. Mm -hmm. Project Alert did a lot of heavy lifting at that point in time because if there were academics who were documenting, actually documenting and actually, you know, uh, um, researching and coming out with publication, you know, on, issues such as this from a feminist pers perspective, as an NGO, probably we wouldn't have had to have a research and we would have relied upon what was coming from this, but there was little or nothing going on. So we had to do a lot of heavy lifting at that point in time. So because all our research researches, all our documentation are from a feminist per uh, perspective, you know, talking about using, reviewing literatures, Getting a, 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 a using femi various feminist theories, you know, uh, uh, be it radical feminist, liberal feminist, Marxist social feminism, and of course we have uh, uh, um, um, African feminism coming on, you know, and all, I mean all up and all of that. Sort of, there are different strands of feminism, okay. and all of that. So, the relationship between feminist. Uh, academics and feminist activists should, I mean, is rightfully and should be a marriage. Okay. We need each other. Okay. The academics, looking at it from the theory, they need to hear from us what is on the field in order for them to theorize. And we need their theories to also oh. test it out here and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So th that kind of placard, I'll call it uh, pracad, uh, pracademics, that's practic, uh, uh, practice and academics in the area of feminism, it's, 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 it's what is needed. It's, okay. the way, it's the right way to go. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you started already. And yeah. then, so for you, what yeah. is feminism? If you were asked to define it. Simply put, I've said it. Feminism is an ideology. It is that idea that talks about social justice for women. It's all about the humanity of women. That women 
are first and foremost human beings before they are women. Some people will say, okay, so you're talking about humanism as against feminism. I say, well, if you want to. But feminism narrows in on women. Humanism is every human being. Feminism is saying a woman is first and foremost a human being. So feminism, feminism for me is about social justice. It's about equality, equity for women and young girls. And then in terms of uh, global feminism, yeah. uh, you said it's an ideology. Yeah. Uh, how does that differ from African feminism? If you want to also tell me what African feminism would mean. You see, the whole thing about ideologies, you know, is that, you know, the world generally, we all are at different levels of growth and experiences. And that has to be recognized. Okay. At some point in history, while women in the global north, we are struggling for ability to vote equal pay for equal work. For us in Africa, we were struggling with colonialism hmm? and even survival as a people. So we were not at the same level with, our, with other women in the global north. Are you with me? So now, so when you're talking about feminism in the global north and feminism in Africa, it's all about women's rights, but we have to recognize that we are at different levels. So while the experience for us as African feminists, one of the key issues face, I mean, some of the key issues facing us include, if you, and you come down to Africa, you also look at rural and urban women. The woman in the rural area, hmm, when she's talking about feminism, if she, I mean, she, will not, she doesn't know that word. But if she's talking about her needs as a woman, she's talking about water, access to road, hmm? yeah. hospitals where to have her child, maternal uh, 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 safety, you know, survival of pregnant women and their newborn babies, yeah. clean water, you know, food health facilities and all of that. So that is her, you can, I mean, when you're talking about what is affecting her as a woman, and then of course, domestic violence. But that's in the scale of what is affecting is first is food, health, and then, okay, I want to be safe as a woman. I don't want to be beaten, you know. So that, if you, if you, so, if you're talking about feminism and a woman in the rural area and a woman in the urban area, that could be slight. I mean, there could be some differences. In terms of the urban, okay, an educated woman who's gotten uh, empowered and got some money, I, honest, I don't want to be discriminated against in terms of wanting to build my house, wanting to rent a place without a landlord, wanting me to bring a man as a, as a shorty or whatever, yes, which is what happens, you know. I don't want to be, I don't have to, I don't, I don't want someone telling me I can't walk because I'm a, I'm a woman, you know. So, the level at which we are in is not exactly a par with feminists in the, in the global uh, north. In the global south, we have quite a lot of issues we are still trying to grapple with. Yes, we have democracy now, but what's, what's the nature of the democracy we have? Mm -hmm. How many women are in Senate? Mm -hmm. Governance issues, participation of women, representation of women, women's voices. You know, we are still grappling with that, a lot of that. In the, in, across various hands of government, in the judiciary, how many women are there? A lot of 
other countries are talking about 50%. We can't, I, we, we've not even been able to get to 30%. In fact, we are not, right now, if you look at the various state houses and, of assembly and the federal laws of assembly, I don't think women, any, in any one of them, it constitutes 10%. We are jubilating a bit with the Kwara State government that recently, in sending names to the uh, State House of Assembly, I think we're about 50%. That's about the only one we've gotten. So for African feminists, we have key issues stemming even from survival. Stemming even from survival discrimination, you know, exclusion. There are even intersectional issues. Women with disability. Whose, their own experience of violence and discrimination is at three levels. Their gender, their disability, and their social status. You know? Okay. Yes, it's normal stage. I know that the challenges are a lot, but in terms of your work, yeah. yeah well, how, where do you see that intersection between a uh, women's movement in this country and uh, globally? The women's movement in Nigeria for, I mean, it's, um, I'm not, um, we are suffering a rollback, which we are trying to get, I mean, it was active, very active in the 80s, uh, early 90s, in the 90s, 80s, like I said, women in Nigeria, you know, and the 90s, and it, it, it came to a peak, you know, um, uh, during the Fourth World Conference on Women, yeah. Beijing, that was the peak of it, that was when we had a strong voice. That was when, as, as I mean, as Nigerians, as women in Nigeria, as women in the continent, you know, we are, uh, we are actively participating in a lot of uh, um, campaigns and advocacies, you know, leading to the Maputo uh, Protocol and several other um, um, regional and international instruments and all of that. But over the last decade to a decade and a half, we seem to be suffering a rollback. I don't know if it's just me or you're getting that sense in other people saying this in terms of we don't really, the women's movement is not really, we, we need to, we are actually now trying to get it reactivated, get it back together. Some arguments from, from some, some people will say the Beijing meeting, the fourth world conference of women and the 12th critical areas of concern sort of led to fragment, fragment, fragmentization because each and every one of us picked something and ran with it. On the one hand, it led to specialization of functions because we had to specialize. They were too, you can't be a jack of all trade. You know, there were issues affecting women in environment. There were issues affecting women in politics. There were issues affecting women in health. Violence against women. So, I picked violence against women and moved with it. Someone else picked women in politics. Another group picked environment. But in so doing, I think we didn't really tie it all up again in terms of still not losing sight of the women's movement. Okay. I yeah. think it, this actually leads me to the next question okay. I was going to ask you what really is the relationship between your work, you know, your relationship with other uh, women feminists and activists or scholars in Nigeria? We are, we, we work to, we, we try, you know, we, we are all doing different things, but we try to come together, but I'm not sure we are, we are, we are, we are succeeding very well. Because if we still had, if the women's movement was very strong, we would not be suffering the rollback we are currently experiencing. Whereby we make 
we take three steps forward and we go back five steps. It is playing out in front of us in terms of the participation of women, active participation of women in governance, in politics, in public life, in various sectors, be it in the health sector, the judiciary, the law enforcement, you know, and all of that. You know. So we, we actually need to, to make a deliberate, a, take a, make a conscious effort, you know, um, take deliberate steps to rebuild and to strengthen the women's movement across all sectors in Nigeria. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. And uh, maybe this will be like a final uh, question from me. Uh, for you, how does this global climate change um, uh, impact feminist movement generally, maybe in Nigeria and then internationally too? Hmm. The issue of climate and the global climate change is actually an issue that is, as in Nigeria, the government, Nigeria, the, the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and a lot of Nigerians are still living in denial like, even about that. But we are seeing it in the sense of the way things are changing. I mean, we are, I'm not sure we are even, it's that discussion has actually even come up in the feminist movement in Nigeria, in the women's movement, I'm not sure that the issue of global climate change, I'm not even sure at this point that we have actually started articulating and talking about that. If I must be, I mean, personally, I don't know, I, but in the movement, I have, because even as a people, even as government, mm -hmm. there's still a lot of denial about it, you know, or even, Understanding of what climate change, how is it impacting? How is it impacting the on environment? The environment, women, on women, on practically everything, because women, when things happen, even in organizations, when organizations are financially challenged and have to shut down programs, the first program they always shut down is women's program. Anything that happens in this life, the first casualties are always women. So it is actually important that we actually, I mean, this coming up now in this interview, I appreciate it so much because we actually, as women and as feminists, we need to start talking about how is this whole issue of climate change affecting us as women, biologically, socially, even in families, in our communities, women are known to be the, 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 you go to rural communities, they are farming and all of that. How is this affecting them? How does it translate? Because if climate change is affecting women biologically and affecting their income and their source of livelihood, then it's also going to translate to several other issues such as violence, health issues. So we actually need to take this discussion up, which, like I said earlier, I'm not sure at this point we are really... There's so many things to deal with. So many... At this stage, after 60 years of... 59 years of independence, 60 years, I guess, we are going to 60 years, mm -hmm. Nigerian women are still talking about maternal mortality. We're still talking about cultural discrimination against women. We are still talking about religious manipulation and misinterpretation as it affects women. There's so much, there's so much we are dealing with. Each time, we, ho we always try to play catch up. Hmm? And the <laughs> we always try to play catch up because we are dealing with so many things social welfare issues, child sexual abuse. There's so much to deal with. Yeah, finally, maybe there's yeah. anything else that I haven't asked that you want to talk about, but I would like that you do like an, uh, your own analysis or evaluation, as well as expectations of development of feminism in Nigeria. Well, my expectation 
is totally in line with that of Chimamanda Adichie, that honestly we all should be feminists. And I'm, I'm expecting, I'm looking forward to a time where right from primary schools, right from kindergarten, you know, we are able to teach, we are able to discuss feminism with our children. Feminism is not just about women. They are male feminists. My husband is a feminist. You know? The closest to feminism, if you ask me, it's, like I said, is humanism. Because feminism is saying that, look, a woman is a human being. She's entitled to her body. She's entitled to be treated the same way a man is treated. So that's about humanism. That's about being human and not dehumanizing a woman. So for me in Africa and in Nigeria is starting from the socialization process, how we bring up our children, how are we bringing up our sons, how are we bringing up our daughters. On the day any child is born, that child is born blank. There's nothing up there. If you don't look at the genitalia, you will not even know the sex of the child because almost all children are born bald. No plated hair, no long wig, no earrings. <laughs> it is the lower part of the body that lets you know, oh, this is a boy or this is a girl. It is in the process of socialization and bringing up of children that we start feeding into them what a boy should be what a girl should be or should not be. And then we are bringing up young men who cannot grow up and cannot accept the fact that a woman should be successful. Mm. Because the socialization says a woman should be dependent on a man. A successful woman will not find a husband to marry. In fact, why should a woman be successful? She's going to intimidate and frighten the young man. These are some of the issues feminism is setting out. I shouldn't be a threat. Feminism is not about women sitting on the head of men. Neither is it about women being under the sole of the feet. It's about we being side by side. You respecting me, I respecting you. You know, so I'm looking forward to that time when we can sit down as men, as women, old and young, and have constructive discussions, you know, on this issue, and also from an early age, socialize our children to deal with each other with mutual self-respect. Recognizing that the school fees you are paying for your son is not any more expensive than the school fees you are paying for your daughter. Mm -hmm. huh? If anything, <laughs> the school fees of the girl may even be more expensive. And all of that. So why, why this gender discrimination? Why this, you know, treatment of women as lesser as second class citizens? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. This interview held today, November 9th, with um, Mrs. Josephine Efa Chukuma. Chukuma. Thank you so much for accepting to participate. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. And good job you are doing out there. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yeah. Thank you.